of Christ, the spotless Lamb who gave His life. What does a good foundation have to do with a great marriage? I'm Bob Fulmer, Director of Marriage Ministries at Fellowship Bible Church with a lesson on how to build a great marriage. Your marriage may be in the middle of a storm right now, like the loss of a loved one, financial ruin, rebellious children, or serious illness, and it feels like the house of your marriage is crumbling under the weight of that storm. Jesus said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Jesus is the rock. His foundation of love is built on grace, forgiveness, trust, and sacrifice. When this is your foundation you build your marriage on, you can withstand the storms that are certain to come. 
If you're looking for a great blueprint for your marriage, check out Reengage, your roadmap to a better marriage. Go to fbctopeka.com slash marriage. Join the revolution and stay married for life. Everybody loves a great love story. Stories are what captivate and move our imagination. So, what's your story? This is Bob Fulmer, Director of Marriage Ministries at Fellowship Bible Church with a lesson on how to write a better story. Whether you know it or not, you are writing the story of your marriage and your story is written by every decision you make. No matter what the circumstances, we always have a choice as to how we plan to process what life throws at us. If you're in a bad marriage, you have to believe that you have the power to rewrite that story. It starts with a decision. Decide to let Jesus into your heart and marriage. Decide to forgive and be more patient. Decide to listen and be kind. God has a great story in mind for your marriage, a story of conquering your fears, defeating hate, and restoring love. So how will your story end? The power is in your next decision. Check out Reengage. It is your roadmap to a better marriage. Go to fbctopeka.com slash marriage. Join the revolution and stay married for life. Here in the fire, I don't have 
Hey, Fellowship family, welcome to Top City Date Night. It's not about the money. My name is Bob Fulmer. I'm the Director of Marriage Ministries here at Fellowship, and I want to thank you for caring enough about your marriage to set aside this time to go deeper with your spouse on the topic of money and, of course, to have some fun, too. Do you know that money is one of the top four problems married couples struggle with most? While there are a lot of programs out there to help you budget, get out of debt, and prepare for retirement, there's really very little information about how to actually talk about money with your spouse. That is, until now. In just a few minutes, you'll get to watch our lead pastor, Joe Hishma, interview best-selling author Shanti Feldhahn about her latest book, Thriving in Love and Money. Now, don't panic. There's no spreadsheets or crazy math you're going to have to learn. You see, for most of us, like 77% of us, it's the conversation we dread, not the actual practice of managing our money. Shanti, along with her husband, Jeff, collected loads of data on this topic, and she is here to share what she's found with you. So snuggle up, have your snack ready, and get ready to grow as you learn to thrive in love and money. Hey, Top City Date Night, Joe Hishma here, and uh, we're going to be talking about a topic tonight that is going to be life-giving, but it may not be easy to talk about. So we're going to be talking about money, and hasn't COVID changed so much around that topic, and as, especially as you engage it with your partner? You're, there, there's so much stress, there's so, many, so, so much discomfort around it, and so uh, we uh, have done something special here at, at Top City Date Night. We have brought in an expert who's also a wonderful person who is going to help us talk about things that are difficult to talk about. She's going to help us talk about money. And I don't know how your relationship is, but I know that after 28 years of marriage, I still need help on this most important topic. Uh, Shanti Feldham is here, and she's come to us from Atlanta. She is a renowned expert on data research and has done wonderful uh, books with her husband, Jeff. They both, both have graduate degrees from Harvard, and they have been committing their lives on focusing on little things that make a big difference in relationships. And so uh, she's written this book with Jeff, called Thriving in Love and Money. And I would really encourage you, if you have signed up for this date night and you got that box, there's a free copy in there for you because we want everyone, every couple that we know of to read this. It's been life-giving. I wish I would have had this 28 years ago because it would have helped me navigate some tense moments in my marriage. But uh, I, this, uh, the books that Shanti has written, over 3 million copies have sold in 26 different languages. Uh, we've gotten to know each other as we've just tried to partner together and how to reach our community uh, with life-giving help. And so, Shanti, it's such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for coming I'm to delighted. Topeka and blessing us with your presence and your wisdom. I and will. I don't know. I don't know if I can live up to that introduction, <laughs> but thanks. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. And we kind of feel awkward because we're in an empty room and most of our people are yeah, engaging us online. online. So welcome, <laughs> welcome. So tell us how this book came about. Oh my gosh, it was, it was the craziest God story. Um, we, Jeff and I had... Um, finished our latest research project, our latest book, and had no idea what we were supposed to do next. Honestly, the business model didn't really work to be able to do a big, expensive research project anymore. And how are we going to pay for this? And there was just a lot of, you know, those moments sometimes where you're just like, Lord, I, it was just a dark place, right? And we didn't know what we were supposed to do. And we got a call out of the blue um, from a big financial services company called Thrivent. They, yep. They're some people may be familiar with them. We mm -hmm. had not heard of them, but it's a very missional organization. It serves Christians. And they said that they were starting an initiative to help couples around money, marriages around money. And they basically said, look, we know from being a financial services company that this is a huge issue in marriage. We don't think it has to be. How would you feel about making this your next research project and us funding it? Wow. and us sponsoring it. And Jeff and I were like, is this a trick question? Like this was such a huge answer to prayer. Um, and we were so overwhelmed. And then about 30 seconds later, we were like, 
oh no, <laughs> because if we're yeah. going to be studying money, that means we have to talk about money. <laughs> And that had been the issue in our marriage that really we were not on the same page. Yeah, so, so we were isn't scared. That, isn't that fascinating? You're doing a major research project and it happens to apply to you. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's what I noticed is that yeah. when I was reading this book, I, I just kept going back. My, that is me. That is me. When you shared some of the thoughts of how couples I'm so talk glad about we're money. We're not alone. You know, oh, okay. we're not alone. <laughs> I know, but that's also something that makes the books re- really special is that you share oh, your thanks. own journey through that. Share us a few of the things that you yeah. learned through this study about yourself. Honestly, one of the the big things that was such a hurdle for, for Jeff and I over the years, we had done all these other research projects, right? And we'd, you know, we'd incorporated a lot of what we'd learned and our marriage had gotten so much better this was the one big area that we weren't on the same page and we felt like we were alone and didn't realize, no, that's actually the norm. And it is, and this is one of the things that was very, very encouraging was that if we can get past this, you can get past this truly because it is so much more simple than what we had realized to be able to dig into the stuff that keeps you from talking about money. And so that's really the incredible part about this is that so much of what holds us back is fairly simple to blow away. Yeah, so tell yeah. us some of those things because uh, you, you guys aren't so uh, unusual, are no. you, in your marriage? <laughs> no. I mean, I, I found that I'm not either, even though sometimes I'd like to think I am as a pastor or something like that, but I've been yeah. humbled by this reality. Yeah, we... We found in the when we were doing the the study and and I should explain all these were big nationally representative surveys and um, we found that seventy seven percent of couples can't talk about money right it's not just us now twenty three percent of you can and for those of you who are in that twenty three percent the rest of us are jealous of you. <laughs> Because yeah, you can turn off the recording right now and do other things on your date night. <laughs> yes. But for the rest of us, the re- right? For the rest of us, <laughs> we kind of think you're mutants. Like, how do you do this? Because yeah. I, I would, every time Jeff would want to talk about this or we'd have to bring up things or try to do something with our non-existent budget, you know, it, I would get defensive or he'd get angry or there was just tense. And, and it is easier, we think, it is easier when you get defensive or whatever to try to just avoid it. And there's a tendency to kind of default a little bit to you do your thing over here and I do my thing over here. And we don't have to talk about money. And the reality that we're living in today is that doesn't work anymore. Like there is so much economic uncertainty likely to be here for some time to come. And we have to be able to get on the same page. Yeah. So one of the things I do in life coaching is I try to help, help someone uh, understand that what they're doing today, if they could picture out five years from now, what's hmm. your destination after this direction? Um, what would it be like? And I think that's the haunting part for me is if I refuse to have these conversations that might be difficult today, yeah. but they might get easier tomorrow then it either gives me a blessing tomorrow and a much greater perspective and a much deeper relationship than just kind of more of the same and more of perhaps even feeling in despair. Well, this is the encouraging part for us is, is that after we got into the, the guts of the research, once we started trying to figure out, okay, how do you create a great relationship around money? Because that's what we were studying, right? It wasn't, how do you have a great budget? Yeah. We're not going to talk about budgets tonight, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how do you have a great budget, but how do you have a great relationship around this topic? And I realized, and, and by the way, this is no, I, I feel like I'm worried that I'm going to say something that's going to like hurt your feelings as a pastor. But one of the things that I've seen that churches tend to do, pastors tend to do, leaders tend to do, is that we tend to go straight to the okay, everybody needs to go to Dave Ramsey, Yes. right? Everybody yes. needs to go to Crown or Compass or one of those courses which is great for the 23%. Like, guess who tends to be really successful at that is the people who can already talk about money. And so I really feel like for most of us, that's kind of the step three 
Mm -hmm. and that Mm -hmm. there's a step two and a step one that have to happen. And the step two is if you're going to talk about budgeting or whatever, getting out of debt, all the things that have to happen, you have to actually be able to talk about money well without the defensiveness and the avoidance and the fighting and the whatever. And to talk about money, what's underneath that is you have to be able to understand what's going on inside of me that makes me get defensive or angry or avoid or whatever, and what's going on inside my spouse. And that is the stuff that all of us can get. And suddenly we have so much more connection yes. to it's, our spouse. I love that because you, you're saying it's not about money. Yes. It's not about money. It's about how we view money yeah. and how we feel about money. Yeah. Okay. We, no one ever taught me that, Chanti, well, and I'm 55 I years didn't old. I not know it either. <laughs> so we, tell us about that research, because your research covered how many couples? Um, more than 3,000. More than 3,000. this topic alone, and then we drew from some of the... We're close to 25,000 uh, okay. people over the last... 15 years or so. And and I loved your data science on how you compiled all this. Oh, yeah? But I also love how you related to it. So uh, you may see in this book that she she talked to everyone while she was in this process, everyone to verify, is this happening in your life? Is this true in your relationship? (laughs) From how'd you do that on airplanes and uh, waiting rooms and all that kind of stuff? Well, the fun thing, okay, see, this is the fun thing about being a social researcher now is that I have an excuse to go up and like have random conversations with people in coffee shops and I feel really bad but I always like hit up the person next to me on the airplane you know I can't do that now in the Mm -hmm. COVID era but but usually like if the person next to me is bored and they're reading Sky Magazine they're fair game you know (laughs) and um and so we have these great conversations because I don't know who they are Right. They they can be completely honest with me. If I'm if I'm talking to somebody who's waiting for someone in a coffee shop, can I just ask you a couple questions? I promise I'm not weird. Like, here's a copy of the book. I'm just doing this next project. And you really hear that heartbeat stuff that sometimes you don't even hear from your closest friends, like that, that deep stuff that's actually happening. Yeah. And it's easy for us to not even honestly recognize what's going on in ourselves. And so that was what we spent the last three years digging out is what is it in me? Like, and I'll give you a silly example. Um, Because like you said, the summary of the whole book is that when you're having tension around money, it's not about the money. It's how it makes you feel and about how it makes your spouse feel. And so um, like, constant little with me and Jeff was would happen when I'd want to pick up Chinese food on the way home from a long day meetings. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, Hey, you know, babe, I'm, I'm just going to run through the, you know, drive through. And, and he'd be like, ah, oh, you know, we have some chicken in the fridge from Costco. You know, why don't I just grill that? It'll be cheaper. Like, why would that bug me? Like, why does that irritate me? And why would it irritate him that I would call and ask that question? And you think, well, it's such a minor thing, but it's those minor things that cause so much conflict in marriage. And so understanding what's underneath that and then, you know, through all the interviews and then doing the surveys to try to see what percentage of people does this apply to? That was how we did the process. Yeah. Yep. So I got to confess, true confession here. Okay. So th- in, in the book, you share the story about uh, you in New York City. Yes. And you ordering uh, a soft drink. <laughs> yes. And your husband giving you that look. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm that husband. Are you I'm really? that husband. Oh my yes. Gosh. Hi, I'm okay. Joe. When my wife <laughs> orders a drink, I kind of give the look like, do you realize it's three bucks? It's three bucks. And then my kids even, my kids today, they're in their yes. 20s and they look at me when we're all out with the family and we're at a birthday can, celebration can and someone Coke, says, Dad? hey, can I get something? Would you, can I get you something to drink? Would you like a Coke product or something like that? They all still look at me looking for the dad look because I've had this thing is we will have water and we will make it miserable. <laughs> so. And that's a perfect example of yes. one of the things that we found in the research. You want me to, to, yes, to please share? Yes, sure, so, sure. Because we found basically five things that if you boil everything down to what are the things that are going under, under the surface, um, it, there's five big patterns that are really 
common that are the thing that's happening under the surface. And one of them, which is really responsible for most of the day-to-day like yes. clashes yep. is that we don't realize we're just not valuing what the other person values. So like, mm. you know, Jeff looking at me funny when I would order a Diet Coke <laughs> with my meal in New yes. York and, and him not realizing that this is a perfect example of he didn't, we were newlyweds in New York and he didn't know really that I dislike the taste of water. I know I'm weird. Like, I, I don't understand why. I just have to have something else to eat with yeah. my meal in order to enjoy it. Otherwise, I'd rather stay home and, you know, save the money and that would be fine too. Um, but if I'm going to be out with a great steak dinner or whatever, but not have something, you know, I just won't yes. like it as much. It's just not it's the same. It's silly, but that's just me. But and that's how you view going out. That's how you I view going out. You value going out. I do. Yeah. And, and that's an example of, and I value having something to drink yes. with it. He doesn't. Yep. And so for him, <clears throat> the perception, which is common with me and other circumstances, probably everybody listening, is it's really easy for, this is the way Jeff always put it. He said, I just thought you had a character flaw. <laughs> You know, like, I just, I just thought, you know, she just doesn't get it. You know, she just doesn't understand how money works. It's so easy yeah. for us to all do that and all, like, look at the thing that the other person is doing or spending money on or saving or whatever and go, gosh, you know, you're just not thinking clearly. You're just not, this isn't the right way of doing it and not realize we're two different people we kind of know this, but we don't translate to, yeah. you're going to care about something different. And you know what? That's okay. That's just as legitimate as what I care about. That's right. Other than things like a gambling addiction or something that's beyond the scope of sure. what we can cover sure. here. But in most cases, it's not that you're wrong and I'm right. It's literally just a difference of opinion. Yeah. Yeah, those differing opinions, different values. Different values. What, what different other judgments. things? What other things are how we approach it? The, well, for this one, I, I'll give you a really common example today. Okay. Okay. So one of the common types of values differences, one of the differences between couples often is that one is more of a spender than the other. Yes. Okay. Someone is often more of a saver. Someone is mm. more of a spender. Even if you have two savers. Usually one of them will be more comfortable spending money. This is a really common gap. And as soon as the coronavirus hit, as soon as the shutdown happened, I mean, honestly, all the savers out there started feeling very vindicated, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> this is the whole point that you're supposed yes. to save for, right? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was interesting. Jeff, one of the things that we're trying to do because of the research is we're trying to actually like articulate, like say things about how we're thinking and feeling inside when it comes to this stuff. Uh, so that it's not just underground, you know, yes. and, and he, it was, it was, it was good of him. He came shortly after the shutdown and he, he said, look, I, I have to confess something. I have to tell you, I've been dealing with a little bit of resentment mm -hmm. towards you because he's more the <laughs> saver. I'm more the spender. And he said, you know, I, I sort of feel like we've lost so much of our income because of course all our speaking engagements are canceled. Sure. And um, he said, we've lost so much of our income. And last year, if we hadn't gone out to eat as many times, if we hadn't gone to Disney World with the kids, we would have thousands more dollars in our bank account right now, which we could mm. really use. And it was interesting, again, because he's been trying to sort of practice what we've been preaching and the research, he kept thinking about it. And then he said, but I realize that's not really fair because when we went to Disney, when we went out to dinner, you were building memories and experiences and closeness. And now we're stuck in quarantine on top of each other. And we like each other. Like we enjoy spending time together. And what you were doing was investing. It wasn't just a net cost, right? There was yes. a benefit. You were investing in the relationship. And him being willing to honor that even though he still disagrees a little bit like we could have gone to a picnic in the park for less yes. money than going yes. out to eat but even though he disagrees to some degree with some of the choices 
his willingness to sort of say, but I see why you did it. I, I understand what you were valuing and, and I, I see the benefit of that. It made it completely different than money conversations we've had in the past where I would have gotten my back up, I would have yes. gotten defensive, it would have been hard to hear, and it made it much more easy for me to honor what he wanted which was to dramatically chop our spending, go on the austerity budget, you know, <laughs> yes. during yes. this season that we're in. But it, it was easier because I could tell that he cared, yes. that I cared about something. Yeah, so that's what I love about your book. And the book is written by both Shanti and Jeff in that they both share their experiences and they share their perspectives, Jeff to men and sometimes Jeff to women and you, yeah. Yeah, you to women and sometimes to men. Yeah, there's not necessarily a whole, there's a few, there's yep. a few gender related things, but most of it, money stuff isn't That's gender right. related. So one of the things that I was reading the book I was really convicted on was just this whole concept of what does a husband hear mm. when a wife shares an idea Yep. That's going to involve money. Yep. And so let me just tell you, my wife is a major collaborator. So okay. she loves to, <clears throat> she loves to sit down and talk and share ideas. And she doesn't have to have all the ideas done in the same day at the, you know, out of the same paycheck. Yep. She just loves to share ideas. And she loves to build the list. And she's very organized on that. And we like to just, she likes to just check them off as they happen. I'm a visionary, big vision thing. And wouldn't it be great if we could do this? And then, then when she'll share a few or five <laughs> or six ideas, I all of a sudden internalize that immediately. And I go, oh no, I'm not making enough, enough money. money. And therefore I feel I'm not, I don't have enough and I don't have enough to keep her happy. Yeah. And when I have said this in a humiliation, a, a moment of humiliation, okay, she has goes, I didn't mean any of that. <laughs> How did you get that? I was just sharing some ideas. It would be and, great to have yeah. your curtains someday. <laughs> like, that's all I meant. Yes. Yeah, so uh, one thing this book really taught me is I'm not alone. Yes. Share no. your research on that. So, I, okay, there's several different pieces of the puzzle that sure. are being triggered by this question. So tell <laughs> me if very you need to go. No, no. Tell me <laughs> if you want to go Shanti. a different direction. But one of the, one of the things that we found yeah. that, okay, this is an example, by the way, of one that is gender okay. related, that um, statistically men and women tend to have different ways of processing money decisions, like mm -hmm. any decisions really, but it really impacts money. Um, where <laughs> women, we tend to be verbal processors. Yeah. Like if we're thinking something through, you tend to know about it because we're thinking it through by talking it through. Mm -hmm. And that's not being sexist or stereotypical. It's yeah. literally the way the female brain is wired. It's more likely. Now there's, there's about, it's about 75%, 25%. About 25% of women are wired differently, but you know, the majority. And the problem is we'll articulate oh man, you know, the curtains, we've had these curtains, or the dogs have clawed them or the cats have clawed mm -hmm. them and I'd love to replace them at some point, but if we do these and we have to replace the, the carpet too, like, you know, we're, we're talking that stuff through. And the problem, not a problem, but the reality is that for men, most men are wired, the brain is wired exactly the opposite, where for men, it's actively difficult to think something through while you're talking it through. <laughs> and so men go underground and yes. they do like a chess match and they're yeah. going, okay, well, if she wants to replace this and then that's going to mean replacing this and then, okay, so that means I have to get a side hustle and I need to drive Uber for maybe three mm -hmm. or four, you know, times a week in order to add up some. And, but if I do that, then oh, I can't coach little league. And, you know, like there's this, this yes. chess match in the head. <clears throat> And the guy will go through, do this for days, but we don't know it <laughs> because it's all underground yes. and it pops out the other end as a decision. And he says, well, okay, so to replace the curtains and the carpet, I'll, um, I'll drive Uber, you know, two or three times a week, but it means that you're going to have to do this with Johnny because I can't. And it also means this and this and this. And now he says, this is what we're going to do. She thinks this is the beginning of the conversation. <laughs> because yes. 
because he just came out with it. Well, no, I didn't mean re now. Like, we could do this in a year. Or No, 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 you can't drive Uber because I need you to do this with Johnny. And he's feeling criticized. What did I just think through all this yes. for? And you don't trust me. And like, and not realizing that literally this is him just processing it all through. She just needs to be able to respond, to process it in her way the same way he just processed it and his. And once they can let each other do that without yes. <laughs> explosion, suddenly you have a much better communication process in your marriage yeah. where you say, and this is something that I've started to do with Jeff, I'm just thinking out loud. Just so you know, I, I'm not asking for this. I'm yeah, not, that, I'm disarms, just, I'm that just, disarms the conversation. Yes, I'm yes. just thinking out loud. And for Jeff to say, okay, I've been thinking, I'm, I'm thinking about this just so you know. I don't want to talk about it yet. I'm not ready, but I'm thinking. Don't think I haven't forgotten. Yes. And so it's, it's amazing. Like if yes. you just give each other permission. So the other difference you mentioned that I could agree with was... It's, it's that whole concept with dudes yes, in that we okay. want to stick it to the man. Yes. And, and by that, we don't want to pay full price. We don't want, it doesn't matter. I mean, we can look at it and say, this, this shirt started off at a hundred bucks, but I can get it for 18. Yes. I'm there, you man. You sound so I'm much there. like Jeff, Pastor. I need to get you and Jeff in a room. Well, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Like that would be gasoline. We would rule the world. Wouldn't we? Yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> So that's, that's that whole picture. And she's just thinking, let's get this done. Yes. Case yeah. in point. Yeah. We have a project in our house. Okay. I have a guy who can do it so inexpensively, <laughs> uh, but he hasn't shown up in three months. <laughs> Every day we walk by that project. Okay. And she's like. And she is so gracious. <laughs> she's so gracious. But it just hits me. He's not going to show up. And every He's woman show up. listening yeah. to this is now turning to her husband and going, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of <laughs> elbows going on in Topeka right now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and candidly, even though that's not really a gender thing, it is like, this is a really, really common pattern. And one of the things that we found is how hard it is for women. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but how hard it is for women to not go, when are we going to do this yes. project? Yes. And, and for the guy, he's like, it's there. Like he mm -hmm. hasn't forgotten about mm -hmm. it. He doesn't need a reminder. And yet, okay, pastor, you need to help us. Cause then what do the women do instead of nagging? Like your wife has been so gracious, but what, what, which, what, what would she do in order to be able to like move this along without nagging? Let's, let's bring her online right now. Cheryl, <laughs> are you <laughs> Call a friend. <laughs> let's call a friend. That's how I feel right now. I want to escape. You're making me feel uncomfortable. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think what it comes down to is, uh, hey, here's our list. Here's our list. And uh, with all these other things, that one's still there. So we haven't checked that one off. But what are some that we can do? Because I tend to dead end. If I yes. can't get that project done, everything's off the table. And what I really need to do is that functions, that gets my mind functioning again. And when I can complete a smaller task, then it gets I can you going. approach that with a new perspective. <laughs> That's so, good. Sorry, I, like that. I, I sound so stupid. No, right? that's I so think, good. I can't get my mind off of this project. <laughs> You're going to walk yeah. off stage. Yes, I'm just going to walk. I'm going to sit there and wait for him to come, and he's not coming. <laughs> I finally, I actually asked Jeff with one of my projects, yeah. you know, I, I finally just said, this is driving me bananas. Yeah. So, I mean, because it, it had been a while, you know, and I tried not to mention it, you know, but I finally asked him, I said, because this is so important to me, is there a point by which we can say, if you don't fix it, because he was going to fix it, right? Yes. If you don't fix it, that I'm allowed to call... To call the man. The handyman, <laughs> right? <laughs> to call the man. Yes. And he said, yeah. he said, yes, by next Saturday morning. So this was like 12 days later. By next Saturday morning, if I haven't done it, absolutely. I won't stand in your way if you want to call somebody to, to fix. And this was like some closet sure. stuff that had fallen down. Yeah. And so I said nothing. I tried to take my own advice, <laughs> which was really hard, and not say things. Yes. 
literally at midnight on Friday night. He's up and on a ladder. <laughs> he's doing that. Closet. Yes. yes. <laughs> but I, he said I, he would have been fine. I, I, yeah. If Saturday morning would have come, I could have called. Yes, yes. So I, thank you for sharing that. Let's move now to talk about another concept yeah. there, and that's resisting oneness. Yeah. We talk a lot, whenever we teach about marriage here, we talk about the two, you know, the man shall leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, that whole Genesis passage, and, and the two shall become one flesh. And finances is another area of practicing that oneness. Yeah. And yet you're talking about how couples resist that oneness. Yeah. And that also rung some bells in my head. So share a little bit about that, that whole concept that you shared in that book. It, it is really sneaky and really common because we all, to some degree or another, 100% of us resist being one in our marriage because yeah. we're, you know, we're sinful people. We're selfish. We, we kind of, we kind of just want to do what we want to do to some degree. So to some degree, some, for some people, it's just a little bit. They've learned, they've grown. For some people, it's a lot, but we all resist being one in our marriage in some ways. And it tends to come out in how we handle money. Other ways too, like you said, but certainly with money. And this is one of those things where we have to kind of confront that tendency to want to do what we want to do. And how is it that I've institutionalized that in my marriage? And the easiest, sort of the most obvious example of it is that you do your thing with your money over here and I do my thing with my money over here and we don't have to talk about it and we don't have to come together. And it's just easier, like technically we share everything, but it's easier for your paycheck to go into your account and my paycheck to go into my account. And yeah, we kind of share some things, and, but you kind of do what you want to yeah. do. Yeah. And that process separates us just as much as it sort of reveals the heart, right? It, it actually forces us apart. And some now, <laughs> some of you may be kind of going, well, but I don't, you know, we're one in our marriage. I I don't separate our accounts. We don't do that. And, and maybe you are, you know, maybe that's a, a big strength. You've grown, you've learned, but mm-hmm. maybe ask yourself a different example. Do you ever try to pull the Amazon package off the front step before your spouse sees it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the same mm-hmm. exact desire to try to do what we want to do that causes some people to separate their accounts entirely. So the- I'm just slow pitching this to you, okay? Yes. Why would anyone want to pull an Amazon box off the <laughs> thing so their spouse doesn't see or kind of go in the back door when they're bringing in new clothes there from the go. Dillard sale okay. or Why something like anyone? that? Why would any rational, reasonable person want to do that? What, what's the issue? Because we want to do what we want to do. And we and, don't want anyone we don't messing want, with it. We don't want to, well, there's several different things going on. Okay. okay? So I'll, I'll give you my example. Okay. I would be the one that would have the tendency to pull the Amazon package off the front step or to go, gosh, when the kids, I was buying the kids back to school stuff and just had to spend way more money than I was planning, but have to buy all this at once. And Jeff's going to freak if he sees all these shopping bags come in. So I will just leave them in the trunk of the car until, you know, he's not in the kitchen. (laughs) I will wait until he's in in his home office and bring them in. Literally, like I would, I would do this. And, and I realized there's a couple things going on there. One is I kind of just wanted to do what I wanted to do. I didn't want to have the conversation about, hey, babe, just so you know, back to school. I know that, you know, it's probably only a hundred bucks budgeted, that ain't going to cut it, cut it. I know you don't mm-hmm. want to hear that, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that ain't going to cut it. And so we're probably going to have to spend three, $400 instead, like, you know, kind sure. of actually having that conversation. And then the other thing, and this was Jeff, his, his willingness to his credit to ask himself, why doesn't Shanti want to talk about this with me? Yeah. What's yeah. my reaction that is causing us to split apart instead of coming together around this? Because I had culpability and he realized he had culpability in both of us 
pulling apart in this area rather than yeah. pulling together. So you talk about that and deep-rooted yeah. fears around money. Yes. Yes. What are some deep-rooted fears that people deal with and that couples deal with when they try to talk about this? This, so the fears is this, is the only other area that is very statistically tied to gender. And again, there's exceptions to this, but most men and most women, men's fear, it's like this gut-level, um, instinctive, real fear of, am I going to be able to provide for my family? Like for many women, it's just hard to grasp how very, very real that is. The image we give in the book is it's the kind of the equivalent of if you have a fear of heights and you're standing on the edge of a cliff. You know, if you, I mean, some of you won't have a fear of heights, but it's like this weird feeling like magically it's going to pull you over and you're going to die. Like it's stupid, but it just feels bad. And so you try to back away from the edge. And for guys, statistically, I think it's about seven out of 10, 70, 71% maybe of guys said it really feels like I am not enough. I really worry that I am not enough to provide for my family. And so the risk of us being financially destroyed is very real because I'm not enough. Yeah, can I and, pause you real quick? Yeah. Right now, just think, if you're a dude out there and that's a predominant thought that you feel when you talk about money or when money is spent, just, you don't have to explain it. Just do one of these. Just do one of these so your spouse sees that that's you because we don't say that. We no, don't always have the don't. courage to say, I don't have enough. We act it though, yeah. right? In our expressions yeah. or it's our first, our leading question. How much did that cost? You know, yeah. rather than really appreciating what the item is or the value. Yeah that our spouses and, place on that. And by the way, for women who are married to the guy who's the spender, because spender saver is not gender That's related right. at all. Mm -hmm. And some of you as women may be like, but he's the spender. Yes. And why would he, it doesn't matter. Guys statistically still are more likely to have that, but I'm worried I'm not enough to provide. Mm -hmm. And that is so real in the hearts of men, the big, strong looking, confident looking sure, men, you know, sure. that we think you are, that we don't realize how much that drives so much of what you do, including things like really feeling like I may lose my job. Like if I, if I tell the boss I need to take this vacation day, like, it, it, that's a real risk. What do you mean that's a real risk, honey? You're amazing. At your, they need you. But it feels like a risk because of that. So what does a spouse need to say to her husband who admits that? So the most important thing from her perspective to him is, and this is what all the men in the studies have, have said, is to feel that she appreciates me and understands that burden. And it doesn't mean that we will necessarily agree, yeah. you know, like just like Jeff didn't necessarily agree with, you know, my desire to go out to eat picnics in the park would have been fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but he understood what it meant to me. And for us as wives to understand that a husband's working a lot of hours or having a difficult time asking for a vacation day off or whatever it is comes from a deep uncertainty and self-doubt and to really be there and show how much she believes in him and take that pressure off by, and if this is true, this has to be a genuine statement, but this is for about 70% of married women to actually say out loud, babe, I just care about you, like, and us mm -hmm. and being together, mm -hmm. like if, if our lifestyle is making you feel the sense of a burden, yeah. we don't have to go to a big vacation at Disney World every year. Like we can go visit friends at the beach and spend like a tiny amount comparatively. Sure. Like, or I don't have to buy a new car. Like we mm -hmm. can buy used cars, like whatever it is that would help take some of that pressure off. One of the things that we tell women, it, again, if you're statistically like this, is to say, is what would I, what could I do that would take the pressure off? And and I told Jeff when we were having this conversation years ago, and we were living in New York, and he was working a hundred hours a week, not an exaggeration, at this big law firm, and it was killing him. And he said the thing that helped shift his 
perception was when I said, honey, I will go be a farmer with you in Iowa as, and have nothing as long as we're together. Yeah. Like that's what matters the most. And we're not together right now because we're never seeing each other. And hearing that I didn't need all the fluffy stuff yeah. lifted that off his shoulders. That's awesome. So sh- share with us. Uh, that was beautiful how you phrased that. Yeah. So what's the corresponding fear with, with a woman? Women. Yeah. So f- what guys don't realize about women is that our, our um, insecurity, our worry is r- radically different in most cases. Now, it doesn't mean that I need to say this out loud. Don't hear me say the wrong thing. <laughs> it doesn't mean that women don't worry about money. Mm-hmm. Uh, women, again, statistically, are just as likely to be savers and worry about money as men. Yes. However, the gut level, that worry, the insecurity that's running under the surface isn't usually, am I enough to provide for my family? That may be there, but it's not like the primary thing. Sure. Unless you're a single mom, statistically. Mm-hmm. That's more likely. Um, but for most women, it's not, are we going to be financially okay but are we okay yeah foundation is, of the relationship ev- is everybody healthy and happy like mm-hmm. is the marriage okay are the kids feeling loved are we together and that is for a guy it's like of course we're together like of course we're happy of course we love each other mm-hmm. and guys don't realize that <laughs> when okay this is just a hypothetical example that might apply to some of you. <laughs> but, <laughs> Which means it's back by research. Yes. <laughs> and okay. my own household. Um, <laughs> but when, let's just say, time of economic uncertainty, and there's some uncertainty about a potential you know, job, is the job secure, whatever, and, and if he is stressed and he's working every conceivable overtime hour <clears throat> and he's whatever, and he's walking around with a black cloud of doom, over mm-hmm. his head and kind of maybe a little more grumpy, a little more stressed. The woman, the question in her heart, like I said, is, are we okay? The answer to that is no. <laughs> and so she is instinctively, just like he's looking to back away from his cliff edge, so to speak. Yep. She is looking to back away from hers. And for him, it's like inconceivable. Like, what do you mean you feel like there's a real risk for us? Like, you know, I'm just grumpy a lot, Mm -hmm. (laughs) stressed. That Mm -hmm. doesn't mean I don't love you, but it sure doesn't feel that way. And so for her, she is looking for ways instinctively to build that closeness up. I was talking to the wife of a police officer who was taking every conceivable overtime hour. And so he wasn't seeing his son. He wasn't seeing his wife. He was distant and getting more distant and she was so worried and she was like so honey um I, I've been thinking about it and how about this since you're working all these late hours how about Johnny whatever the boy's name Johnny and I come and we can have dinner with you a couple nights a week at the deli near the station just so that we can be together because she's instinctively looking to build back up that closeness which is great but guess what those things we do to build closeness will often cost money, cost money. And so that pulls him closer to his cliff. And you can see how there can be a sort of a negative cycle unless you actually kind of honor the real fear that's in the other person's heart and and go, you mean really like when I'm distant, like you feel like we may not be okay? I love you. Like, of course I love you. Or really, you feel like you may not be enough? Like that's a real thing? And to actually have those conversations just being able to talk that through. Yeah, and the key there, so the key there can't be, why do you feel that way? (laughs) I don't feel that way, because that creates separation, right? It's Well, it is acknowledging. Sure. I don't feel that way. Yes. But clearly you do, you know, and and (laughs) realizing. But one gives shame and guilt. Yes. The other is trying to understand. (laughs) Exactly. Which you, that's that's the goal of this, right? Is to understand how do you view money? How do you feel about money? And the decisions around money, right? And yourself. And yourself. I mean, it's so tied in. All of this is so tied in to all of these feelings. We just didn't 
recognize that we had candidly, which is why it was really liberating <laughs> once I started seeing some of the numbers come in. Sure. Like, I'm not weird. I mean, yeah. I might be weird, but I'm not weird. <laughs> like other I'm weird people. with people, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's so true. So here's a question I've got. If, if we've talked about the differences between men and women yeah. as they talk about this topic. But what about the interest about talking about this topic? Because I've talked to a lot of couples in counseling and yeah. in a pastoral role. And usually there's one who goes, yes, we need to make so many changes yeah. and this will be so good for our relationship. And the other one goes, no, I don't want to talk about that. And so it really doesn't matter that you, when you talk to one, if two aren't on the same yep. page, it's kind of... How, what do you say to a couple like that? So that was us. Okay. And I bet you can guess who was who <laughs> in that conversation. And, and I'll give you, this is sort of humiliating, but I'll share the example and um, what happened because it's, it's a perfect microcosm of what we found in the research, which is that Jeff was, he's the planner. He's the guy, he was like, can we go to Dave Ramsey? You know, let's, let's do this. And I would always, every year when Dave Ramsey, the course came to our church and every year, can we do this? I'm like, you know, bud, I'm looking at the calendar. I'm going to miss <laughs> half of these days. I'm traveling, yes. conveniently yes. traveling. And, and so mm. the next year, can we do it this year? Oh gosh, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm going to miss all this stuff. And I just, that happened year after year. And finally, Jeff went on his own because I wouldn't go with him. Now, <laughs> it's really embarrassing to admit it, but that was what happened. Now, pull back the curtain. We still didn't have a budget a year or two, three later because Jeff did it on his own. So of course you can't do a budget <clears throat> without both people being mm -hmm. in on it. So finally, when we started this research, he kind of went like, and he came, and again, we're trying to put into words the stuff that we've been finding. And he said, I realized what it was. And, yeah. and I was like, tell me, because I still don't know sure. what it was. And he said, you know me. And Jeff is kind of one of those all or nothing kind of guys. Like he, mm -hmm. He's like, you knew that because of the way that I am, I would go to Dave Ramsey. It would be like gasoline on a flame. <laughs> and I would come home and want to put the family on a, the equivalent of a 500 calorie a day diet. Yes. Like we'd eat Franks and beans for the next year yes. in order to save this much money. And, and he, when he said that, I went, yes. That was, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it, but that was exactly what was inside of me. And when we started talking about it, I realized that this is a perfect little microcosm of the reason mm -hmm. so many couples have one person who wants to talk about it and mm -hmm. the other one is like, no way. Sure. Because I'm going to feel railroaded. Yep. I'm going to feel like my values don't count. And candidly, and Jeff, if Jeff was sitting here, he would say this, I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, but Jeff was giving off that vibe of, yeah, you just have a character flaw. <clears throat> I have to educate you. Sure. As opposed to, I need to understand what you value. And yep. we need to make sure that whatever we're doing sort of honors both of us. And that's something so much that often the money person in the relationship just doesn't sure, realize. Sure. So just the encouragement for those of you who are listening to this that kind of fall into that category. The cool thing is that if both of you will actually learn what's inside you to be able to articulate that to your yeah. spouse and if you'll take each other seriously, this is so much easier yes. than you've been making it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, this is off script, okay. and I'm sorry. All I'm right. putting you on the... No, I put you on the spot okay. with one of those questions No, earlier. that's okay. So you have, in typical stereotypes, yeah. the man handles all the finances at the home, and the wife kind of just wonders where things are at. Yeah. But um, there's actually, there's, there's wives who really do a better job than their husbands on keeping track of their spending yeah. plan and, you know, yeah. paying the bills and, and all that. So... What, what advice would you give to whoever is doing that and is in the know on how things flow? Is they're in the know on that, but the other person is not in the know. How would, what, what advice would you give to that couple 
yeah. on how to survive those conversations. So actually, it's interesting just on the stereotype. Yeah. Again, when I when I did the surveys, I was like, I don't know what we're going to see. And sure. it was actually interesting. More women than men handle the finances. OK. Isn't that interesting? Yep. Um, and so it, it just tends to be whoever has the kind of predisposition and the time and, sure. you know, whatever. Um, but the reality is, is that often one person isn't in the know. And sometimes, by the way, you might be surprised by this. Sometimes that's on purpose. Like, I don't want to know. Like, okay. it's just too, la, 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 not listening, yep. not, not even resigned. Like, okay. like. I don't like a lot of husbands said I'm so I've got so much of that cliff fear of am I going to be able to provide it's just going to stress me out okay to know where we are and so I'd rather not know not listening and so that's a common dynamic like you would not believe all the different ways we kind of cope with this topic mm -hmm. but the key that we found again it all comes back to being able to talk about it in a way that feels low risk, in a way that feels honoring to each other. And so, and I'll just give you an example. We were talking to one couple where the husband was not the one who did the money and he didn't want to hear about it because it stressed him out. Because every time he heard her say, okay, we got to cut back a little bit until next Friday, I'm not doing a good job of providing. I, I need to I need to just quit this like low paying job and go get the sure. job in the skyscraper that I won't ever see you. And that was his overreaction. And so she would then overreact to that and it would just be bad. And so that's an example of the answer for them was, okay, I I hear that you don't want to, you know, hear all these little details because it stresses you out. You don't, we don't need to hear all the details. How about this? How about we just, and this ended up being what worked for them. Sure. How about us just getting together maybe once a month and I'll just brief you. This is what the wife said. I'll just brief sure. you as the husband on where we are so that you sort of get a regular sense as opposed to, hey, this week we're in trouble. You know, mm -hmm. kind of that sort of feeling. Yep. And, um, and for whatever reason, that worked for them. Sure. And those, whatever works for you, will be dramatically different for every person listening to this, probably. Yeah. Yeah. For some people, the idea of monthly budget meetings is like, yeah. <laughs> like Don't horrible. attach it to date night. Exactly. Well, some, <laughs> That's what some, I keep hearing. <laughs> some people keep saying, oh, do yeah. a date night and talk yes. about your money. And for some people, that's like the worst thing. Like for me yes. and Jeff, that is the worst thing that we would want to do. Mm -hmm. However, it's what ever works for you guys yeah. the key is back to that oneness thing mm -hmm. the key is where can you two be in unity and trying to be together rather than institutionalizing sure that it's you and me instead of we yes and you talked about uh that in your book on oneness that yeah that if you think the best of your spouse, in other words, you don't call how they feel a character issue because <laughs> yes. that all automatically gives them guilt and shame. Yes. But if you just uh, allow them to think the best or call them to think the best, that their words and even how I hold you in my, in my mind and in my heart will change yeah. how I treat you. We, we found that was actually one of the most amazing findings from this project and a previous one we had done on finding out what are the secrets of the happiest couples. Okay. Like, what are they doing differently than everybody else? And it, we saw this in this one as well, that it is so easy to instinctively think, I hate to say think the worst, but kind sure. of. Like, they just don't understand. They, they're killjoy. They're, you know, whatever. And, and instead, reframing it and going, no, they, they care about me. They care about us. They're trying to do what they think is the best. We just have a difference of opinion. And so how can we resolve that difference of opinion rather than, oh, you know, he just tries to take all the fun out of yes. life. Or you always, just, you never, yeah. Exactly. Okay. It, it, is, it is dramatic what happens when you force yourself to go, wait, I'm thinking the worst of this person that I'm married to. That's ridiculous. Like, I know yeah. they care about me. Yeah. You know, and you reframe that. It changes everything. Yep. So 
Thank you. Okay, so let's switch subjects. Not switch subjects, just switch a direction. Yeah. You're a social researcher, and yet you also research the Bible on this project. Yeah. And you kind of observed how many times Jesus is talking about money. Oh my Why? Gosh. Why is Jesus talking so much about money? <laughs> Did you, I mean, until I looked into this, I was like, yeah. are you kidding? Like he talks about money way more than you think. Yeah. I think he had 39 parables, something like that. And a third of them were on money. I think it was 11 or 12, like a huge, like more than any other topic. Yes. And why is that? And I realized once I started looking at the oneness thing, I think one of the reasons, I would never presume to say this is why God did that, yeah. but <laughs> but I think one of the main reasons is that it is so tied to the heart. You know, that statement that Jesus makes that where your treasure is, there your heart will be, right? Where your money is, your heart's going to be right there with that. Yes. And, and we know there's so much surrounding that statement and one of the things that I saw in a whole new way once I started seeing the research data come back is that I had always heard that that was talking about the fact that money reveals the heart, which it does, where like, for example, a pastor, like our pastor would talk on tithing and giving and talking about that if we're willing to to tithe and just go, this is kind of scary to give back our 10%, but it shows whether we're trusting God or not. Like it reveals that heart, okay? Sure. But the piece of it that I hadn't seen until I did this research is, although that is definitely a piece of it, that's definitely true, it also means that money steers the heart. And like, for example, if you're scared about joining bank accounts, like, it's easier. Your mom always told you, keep a little bank account on the side in case he flakes mm -hmm. out on you or whatever. Or he's thinking, you know, but what happens if she spends money in a way I don't appreciate or whatever? Like, it's easy for us to have those two bank accounts. And that institutionalizes that it is you and me, not we, right? Yes. That there were two people, not one. Mm -hmm. And so when you force yourself to go, okay, this is scary, but I'm... I'm going to choose to trust you and trust God even more. And okay, let's join everything. Let's be transparent. Let's share where the money is coming and going. Let's not try to hide things. Let's not sneak the bag in when my husband isn't watching sure. or the golf clubs when my wife isn't watching. Um, when we do that and we take that kind of scary step, we are steering our heart toward oneness. Yes. And yes. we're steering our hearts towards trusting each other and intimacy and connection and trusting God who brought us together. So it's both of those things, I think, is sure. what, one of the key reasons why that was such a big theme for, yeah. for Jesus. So you've had quite the experience. You finished the book and you're about to publish it, and not publish it, but make it available for sale and everything. And then COVID hits. Oh, gosh. Did you and, have to bring this up? <laughs> and so, I mean, you're also a, uh, you're a speaker. You speak at different events. And yes. You're coming here and all that. Yes. And that radically altered your business plan. Yes. How it's, did it's, you develop trust of God in the midst of that? I, I wanted to hear that. It one. is every author's dream to work for three years on a book and then have it released one week before a national emergency is declared. Yeah. Like that is, of course, a great business plan. I think we sold 17 copies and they probably went to you. <laughs> so, but That's not true. No, well, it, 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 thankfully we've started to see a little more traction, but it's sure. definitely not what we would have chosen. Yeah. It, it just isn't. And that's the case probably for a lot of people listening. Yeah. This moment we're living in is not what we would have chosen. And yet, we have seen probably like a lot of you, these amazing ways God has provided. I mean, just super miraculous. And I'll, I'll give you just one example. If okay. you do you mind, just Please. an example of this. So we, you know, all of the, as a public speaker, all the events in the spring were canceled and most of the summer. And it's just, there's so much that comes along with that. Like, I'm like, Lord, am I going to have to lay off my team? Like there's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody who owns a business is having these same sure. kinds of conversations. And 
we were really in this, how do we do stuff that has to happen? Like our daughter has asthma and she was having a really hard time um, this spring. There was a lot of cold weather and she got sick and that triggered her asthma. And we had to do this really expensive pulmonary function test that was going to cost $2,000. Well, $2,000, that might as well have been a million. Like, sure. where are we going to come up with $2,000? And, um, and I get this call as I'm literally driving in the car and I'm crying because I'm like, Lord, how are we going to pay for this? And I get a call from the publisher of my uh, devotionals. I, I also write some devotionals, which is very fun. And the publisher calls. He goes, um, so Shanti, uh, listen, I need to apologize. Um, but we discovered there was a glitch in the royalty system from last year. And you didn't get all the royalties you were owed. And I'm putting a check for $2,500 in your mailbox. Wow. Awesome. Like, I want to cry just telling the story. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's just, it was so clear that God was just, yeah. he's at work. Sure. And it's all part of this. Money is all from him and for him. And it's not ours anyway. Yeah. And it's his job to make a way. That's awesome. Hey, thanks for sharing that. I, I got a follow-up to that. Yeah. So you went from a time where you and Jeff weren't able to talk constructively about finances yeah. and money. And yet when something like that happens and you are, yeah. how did that bring you together? Oh, I mean, this is a perfect example of us just me coming into the kitchen and telling Jeff what happened and both of us just breaking down yeah. in tears, partly because it's just such an example of God's goodness partly because this is the kind of thing that we realized if that had happened a few years ago, we would have been scratching and clawing and fighting and upset or defensive and distant and avoiding. There sure. would have been so much, ugh, you know, just stuff going on because of this worry about money. And instead we realized not only had we been waiting for okay, God, what's your answer here? But we hadn't been having the usual arguments leading up to it, yeah. you know, of me going, but we have to do the test. And him like, but we don't have the money. And, you know, whatever those arguments would have been, they hadn't been happening because we've been able to be so much more together on yeah. this topic. That's awesome. Shanti, thank you so much for being here. Sure what an thing. honor to have you in Topeka and to speak in. I, and one of our, our, our mission here at Fellowship Bible Church is to help people find and follow Jesus Christ. And Jesus cared about money because he saw it was connected to our hearts. And he, he, that's the target of a relationship with Jesus is our hearts. And as you uh, learn and grow in marriage or in a relationship, uh, we want to come alongside you and help you navigate some of the most difficult issues that you're going to have to deal with. Because when you can talk constructively and with joy about those topics, my goodness, there's not just happiness that happens. There's true fulfillment in a relationship with Christ. And so thanks for being a part of this. Bob, I'm going to move this over to Bob, and he's going to just share with you next steps. And Bob is our leader here. Bob Fulmer is our leader of Marriage Ministries and a wonderful guy who is here to really help you have a thriving and joyful marriage. So Bob, take it away. Well, there you have it. I hope you got as much out of that conversation as I did. That's information Luann and I needed to hear 37 years ago. So what's next? First, I want to encourage you both to go to Shanti and Jeff's website, thriveinloveandmoney.com assessment to take the free assessment and to see how each of you scores in regards to how you communicate about money. Second, I want to invite you to continue the conversation with Shanti by signing up for her weekly blog. Just go to shanti.com blog and sign up. Every week, she delivers tons of great information to help guide and keep your marriage moving forward. And last, I want to be sure you answer the questions that are listed in your envelope. You can start with what I think is the most important question. What is the one thing I could do to make it easier for you to talk about money with me? Hey guys, thanks again for joining us for this Top City Date Night at Home event. We hope you had fun, learned a little more about your spouse to bring you closer together, and we hope that we started a conversation for you to continue. 
Be sure to check out our website for future date night events. And remember, great marriages don't happen by accident. They take a lot of practice. Have a great week and God bless.